you are listening to the Invitation Church podcast. To learn more about Invitation Church, visit us online at invitation605.com. You can also download our app on iTunes and Google Play by searching for Invitation 605. All right, tonight we are continuing our series in the book of Acts, and uh, we get to uh, meet somebody in the book of Acts uh, named Stephen, and it got me thinking about famous Steves in the world. So Griffin's going to throw some famous Steves up here, uh, wondering if there's anybody who can name like five of these nine Steves. Can anybody do five, you think? Just show me a hand if you can think you can do five, Okay. Who can do seven? Somebody can do seven. How many can do all of them? Anybody? Can anybody do all of them? How about eight? Somebody can do eight of them? Okay, awesome. So, uh, number one, tell me who number one is. Steve Jobs, good. Uh, Number two, Steve Irwin. How about number three? You're going to show your age. Steven Seagal. You have to say it like that. Good. All right. Number four? Stephen A. Smith. No, I will not do an impression. Number five? Spielberg. Good. How about number six? Steve Carell. Seven? I will be here, man. I will be here. Totally. Sorry if you're like young in the house and you're like, I don't know who that is, but I think my mom listens to him. Yeah, that's seven. All right, <laughs> number eight. Stone Cold Steve Austin. All right, and number nine. Good. All right, how about a bonus Steve? You want to do a bonus Steve? Show us a bonus Steve. <laughs> Steven Tyler. Yeah, good. So tonight, Steven. Uh, He's not famous because he has a song. He's not famous because he has a movie. He's not famous because he even has a book. He's famous tonight in the scriptures, not because he lived for a really long time and that the pages of his life fill this book. We're talking about him tonight because of a series of choices that he made and an example uh, that he gives to us. Really, the life of Stephen teaches us that the choices that we make reveal the story that we live. Like the way that we interact in the world, like our relationships outside of this place really dictate what we believe, the story that we have bought into, that we have found ourselves and at Christmas time, my family and I went to Disneyland. I think we have another picture of that. And yes, I carried people in my family for many steps during those days. You know what that's like, 10,000 steps a day. And we got, what's cool about Disneyland is Disneyland is an opportunity to climb inside of another story. Right? So we got to experience all of the stuff, waited in line for pictures with Goofy and Mickey Mouse, and yes, we did the Cars ride, and all of that, all these kinds of stories that we get to step in. And I think Disneyland really provides us with an opportunity to think and reflect on why in the world we did this in the first place. No, I'm just kidding. Gives us an opportunity to reflect on the story that we live the story that we have bought into, the story that we have found ourselves in, and there's lots of stories that we can claim on planet Earth. And for some people, uh, they have claimed an accumulation story. So what really matters, what life is really about, is like how much you can grab onto, like how much you can hold And so you're maybe not as happy as you could be because you haven't collected enough stuff. And what you have isn't new enough, isn't big enough, it's just not enough. And you can build a life, you can wrap your life around accumulation. Where the last thing that you got is not satisfactory and you need something new and better and faster. And we can live 
an achievement story. And the achievement story wraps itself around this question, like, have I earned enough? Have I produced enough? Like, have I reached some kind of status? So one story is to accumulate all that you can accumulate. Another story is to achieve, to climb some kind of ladder, to reach some kind of status, to be looked at in a certain way, and so we can live a story of accumulation or achievement. But we can also live a story of affirmation. And when we've wrapped ourselves in the story of affirmation, what really counts, what really matters, what we're really chasing after is what everybody else thinks about us and the life that we've built and the life that we live. Like even people who don't even know us, we wonder what they think of us. In Stephen's life, his testimony, we're going to meet him in a second in the scriptures, is going to call us to consider what kind of story we have bought into, what kind of story we've wrapped our lives around, what kind of story we are living. So here's the context. So Acts chapter 6, Stephen gets himself in a little bit of hot water. Stephen's really likable. There's a group of people who have found themselves wanting to listen to him, wanting to follow him. And of course, when that happens, there's always jealous people. Because Stephen's getting the attention and not them. And Stephen finds himself brought in front of a group of people called the Sanhedrin. And you can think of the Sanhedrin as like a religious supreme court. And Stephen has been accused of doing something wrong by the leaders and the teachers of the law. Like these Jewish men who have been waiting for a Messiah, who have been teaching the Torah, who have been talking with people about what it looks like to be faithful to God and how to follow Sabbath and making sure we follow all 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Forget the 10, bring on the 613. And the accusation placed at the feet of Stephen is that he's been speaking against the temple and he's been speaking against the customs of that day. And it's not even a true accusation. Stephen isn't saying anything that Jesus didn't already say. But he's placed in front of the Sanhedrin, these leaders, and they want to know if this is true. Like, are these accusations true? And that's the end of Acts chapter 6. And then if you look at Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, Stephen preaches a sermon. And it's like 50 verses long, and we're not going to read it all tonight. I would encourage you uh, to read it this week because it's awesome and it outlines the history of God's people. But Stephen says three things standing in front of these religious leaders, these people who have the Torah memorized, who have decided for themselves they know what faithfulness to God looks like, and they can point out unfaithfulness to God in the life of another person. And the first thing that Stephen says is that God's people have a long history of not listening to him. Stephen traces the story of the people of God all the way back to the very beginning of the Old Testament. And there's just a long history of the people of God not listening to what God has to say. And I think we can say tonight that there's really at least two reasons for that. Like one reason that the people of God have a long history of not listening to God is because we're an impatient people. Like, we want what God has promised ultimately and eventually now. And so we see this in the Exodus generation. 
Like these people who are brought out of Egypt and being brought into a, a promised land that God had promised to give them all along the way, and they get impatient, they get tired, they get grumpy, and so they turn to Moses and they say, like, hey, would you bring us out here to kill us? It was better in Egypt, because at least in Egypt we had a meal, and we knew what life was going to be like the next day. We weren't simply wandering. We were suffering, but we weren't wandering. And so the people of God have a long history of not listening to God because of impatience, but also because of pride. Stephen says, y'all are not the first people to not listen to what God has had to say, and they've wrapped themselves around pride while you're like, okay, what's pride about? Pride is just saying like, hey, I'm not, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to do uh, what God has asked me to do. And just to be honest in the room tonight, like there's a lot of stuff in this book that is very uncomfortable. I don't know if in family pictures you ever had to wear a turtleneck to family pictures. Anybody in the house? Any 80s babies in the house had to wear a turtleneck back when Shopco and Kmart did family portraits. Can I tell you that sometimes the words of Jesus are going to feel like a turtleneck to you? Not comfortable. Not easy. Not desirable. Not something that you would even be excited about when you're seven and you just can't wait for the thing to get off. And your mom's like, we're not going out to eat after this, David, Michael. So just like in a place of honesty tonight, like what Jesus has come to proclaim on planet Earth, what he's come to teach, is not easy to do. It's not easy to take up. Like it's going to ask something of us. Like is his words true? Is there life in them? Is it beautiful? Is it the source of our hope? Yes. And is it difficult? Yes. So Stephen's like, the people of God have a long history of not listening to him. The second thing that he says, Stephen says, you know, like God doesn't live in a building made by human hands. So before Solomon, who's the son of David, he gets to build this incredible temple in Jerusalem. And it was like nothing that had been seen before. And Stephen says, you know, before that temple was built, God didn't live in a building. So just because there's a building now that you think is wonderful and mighty and you're proud of it, it doesn't mean that God has chosen to take up his residence there. God has chosen to take up his residence in planet Earth. And you can't contain him. You can't lock him down. You don't get to dictate and control the people that God loves. You don't get to dictate and control the way that God shows up in the world and who he gives grace to, who he forgives, who he empowers, who he uses. Because this book is filled with people that are mighty tools in the hands of God. And none of them we would pick. None of them we would go, oh, I bet God wants to use that person for sure. God does not live in a building made by human hands. And then that takes us to Acts chapter 7, verse 51. He says this. You stiff-necked people, with uncircumcised hearts and ears. Tonight, it's just going to be good enough to understand that that means having a heart and having an ear that has turned away from God. You're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet that your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through the angels, but have not obeyed it. 
And when they heard this, they were furious. And they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And at this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, which means he died. And Saul was there, giving approval to his death. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles, were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. If you were to count how many times in the Old Testament a prophet came and said that the people of God were acting in a stiff-necked kind of way. I counted 20. Again and again and again. The people of God are known as prideful, certain, not very curious, not very open to repentance, to changing, to turning from their ways. And so Stephen uses that term here. Like, you're just like your fathers, you're stiff-necked. Stephen wants to say, like, you killed the Son of God. Like, you killed what you prayed for. Like, all the way back in Exodus, what were you asking for? You're asking for a deliverer. You're asking for a a Messiah. They would have used this word, Mashiach. A Messiah, one who would rescue and save and redeem You killed what you prayed for. You rejected what you prayed for. You pushed away what you prayed for. And Stephen's defense is this beautiful call to repentance. Like this beautiful call to to turn around from this story that you have embraced and to Get your arms around this Savior that has been given to you. But you buried him, which is so beautiful and powerful. It's a little detail in this narrative that we could spend 40 minutes talking about. But twice in this narrative, Luke wants us to know where Jesus is in this moment. And a lot of times in the scriptures, Jesus is seen and known as seated at the right hand of God, and that's a picture of power and authority. But I don't know if you noticed it when we just read it together where Jesus is. He's not seated at the right hand of God. He's standing. He's standing. And I think that's just like a beautiful picture for the posture of Jesus. That he's not seated in a passive way. It would be very different if I had everybody stand up and for the whole rest of the time you just stood. Like you're ready. It's an active posture. And so Jesus is involved in what's going on. His power is in these words of this young man who's standing in front of a bunch of people who are convinced they have it nailed. They've got it all figured out. And I think Stephen, in a really simple way just wants to say like a story without Jesus is an incomplete story. Like you can know God and you cannot be like Christ. And you know all the stories, you followed all of the commandments, but you've missed Jesus. Like you've rejected the one that you've prayed for, the one that you have sought, you pushed him away. 
And a story without Jesus is an incomplete story. I mean, we know what this is like on planet Earth. Like, what's, I don't know, what's the little mermaid without Ursula? It's an incomplete story. Like, what's the Grinch without Cindy Lou Who? Where are you Christmas anyway? Like, what's, the, what's Aladdin without Jafar? What's the Lion King without Uncle Scar? What's Toy Story without Buzz Lightyear? What's Star Wars without Jar Jar Binks? I mean, Darth Vader. And like, what's a story if Jesus isn't in it? It's incomplete. Like, it's, it's the center of things. Paul says this in the book of Colossians. That Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn above all creation. And that in him, what? All things hold together. In Jesus, everything that God has spoken is held together by his miracles and by his teaching and by his life and by his resurrection. And then, yes, Stephen is brought into the streets of the city and they throw rocks at him until he dies. And Stephen's life serves as this beautiful picture that the choices that we make reveal the story that we claim. I invite the band up as we close tonight and I think what's beautiful and challenging about this the question that I'll speak for myself, I was left with after working my way through this this week. Like, what story would our choices say we've claimed in 2023? Like, we're about seven weeks into 2023. And I just wonder if we asked our choices if we asked how we've spent our time, if we've asked, if we would ask our, our language and our posture what kind of story we have embraced, they would answer us. And I think for this church, it's just going to be really important for us that we don't reject what we've prayed for. That we don't miss the way of Jesus as we go about doing church together. Because as we talked about in the book of Acts, that the, we said earlier this fall that there's two Israels that you're going to start to see in the book of Acts. An Israel who's associated themselves around the temple. And an Israel is going to pop up that has associated itself, wrapped itself around the Jesus way. And it just so happens that this young man who has wrapped himself around the Jesus way is brought before a bunch of people who have wrapped themselves around the temple. And the people who have wrapped themselves around the temple kill this young man who has wrapped himself around the life of Jesus. Two Israels. And so I just think the question for us as individuals and as a church tonight is, Well, what our choices reveal about the story that we've embraced. And so, of course, there's a table in the last hours of the life of Jesus. And Jesus gathers these disciples together and they remember the exodus and the deliverance of that time, of that moment. And Jesus takes bread and he breaks it and he takes the wine and he gives it to the disciples who are seated together in that moment. As if just like a, a reminder and an opportunity to be clear about what the story is about. Because he says, hey, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to give my life. My body's going to be broken. My blood is going to be shed. 
as a picture of what this is all about. That death doesn't have the last word. That the power of sin is dealt with in a moment of victory and that the resurrection is going to be the air that will fill the earth. And so Peter and John and Andrew and Simon don't wrap your lives around the wrong story. Don't wrap your lives around an affirmation story. Don't wrap your lives around an accumulation story. Don't wrap your lives around an achievement story. Because those stories, why? Those stories don't end with resurrection. Those stories end with the tomb. They end with death, ultimately. But the story of Jesus ends with the resurrection. Ends with these disciples running back to tell all of the other disciples what they've seen and heard, that, oh my goodness, Rome tried to kill Jesus, but he's alive. Oh, that we would wrap our lives around that story. And that it wouldn't just impact this place and when we're in here, but it would impact out there because there is a world out there who's in desperate need of that story and is in desperate need of us being clear about where our hope and our identity come from. And they come from the table. And so as we end this gathering tonight, we just want to take some moments to sit at the table uh, together. So the way that's going to work best, I'm going to invite uh, Joe and Lisa to come up. They're going to help me over on uh, this side. And so if you're kind of in this area of the room, it's great if you kind of come up uh, this way. If you're in that area of the, of the room, um, come up that other way. Awesome, if you want to take that. Thank you so much. I invite Kendall Vandenkamp if he wants to come up. He's going to um, help me serve over on this side. And I do have two baskets of crackers. There's a darker cracker that's gluten-free and a lighter cracker that has gluten in it. I've been saying gluten-full. I'm just going to stay with that for now. Um, and then there's buckets in the back, a little ice cream bucket. I'm going to give you this. Awesome, thank you. Uh, where you can, after you've come up, where you can place um, your cup. But there's a prayer that we like to pray as we come to the table, and it's just this, uh, that this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. And it is to be made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little you who have been here often and you who have not been for a very long time, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come, because it is the Lord who invites you. Uh, so as you feel led in a posture of receiving this life that Jesus has come to offer, uh, would you come and be seated around the table together? Thank you so much for joining us on the Invitation Church podcast. I want to encourage you to take the message that you just heard and receive every part of it. Every promise from God, every declaration of his great love for you, every word of hope, every reminder that you have been made for more. Allow what you've heard to take root in your soul to allow Jesus to do the deep work that only he can do. I also want to encourage you to be part of what we are doing here at Invitation as we invite people to live the way of Jesus. Go to the app and become a regular giver, an investor in the story that God is writing in this place. Also, if you found the message meaningful, we'd love to have you share it with someone else as you partner with us in carrying the message beyond the walls of the church. I want to thank you for being here with us. Grace and peace.